Hello, Trailblazer fans, Blazers Edge readers. Welcome to our first video cast of the playoffs. I am Sam Tung, along with Dave Deckard, here to break down game one as the Trailblazers come away with an overtime victory, Dave. An incredible game uh, in game one on the road in Houston as Portland able to steal home court away from the Rockets. A ton to get to. We have a number of different topics that we want to touch on today, Dave. But first, I know you wrote the recap, obviously continuing coverage on Blazer's Edge of, of all the news, all the analysis in written form, but wanted to hear it from you here on the video cast. Your thoughts, uh, general impressions of that game one, especially the outstanding performance from LaMarcus Aldridge. Okay, let's start there. I mean, Aldridge just put in one of the greatest playoff performances in franchise history and really one of the best ever in the league. But he just put himself in a pantheon with your Clyde Drexler, your Bill Walton, not necessarily in ultimate significance because this was a first-round matchup and it's a 4-5 seed and we're probably still not talking championships and what have you here. However, as far as statistics go and impact on the game and just gutting out a win, you could not ask for a better performance than Aldridge just gave. This whole game was crazy. It was a morass of, of swirling referee calls and Pat Beverly antics and missed shots and bad decisions and turnovers and rebounds here and there. And, and it was just like all this chaos was happening everywhere. And Aldridge was the mountain peak. He was the one guy for the Blazers, sticking above the fray the whole time, just saying, I know what I'm doing, I know how good I am, I know how I can swing this game, and I'm going to give you absolutely everything. And he did. Oh, my gosh, you know, it, what was it, 46 points, 18 rebounds, yep. uh, got block shots, um, decent defensive rotations, and just providing the stalwart that the Blazers need because, you know, this is a little bit what happened to the Rockets, yes? Uh, the, both teams' inexperience in the playoffs showed in this game. The Rockets were led more or less by James Harden who decided to base his so shot selection on, hey, I'm James Harden, and, you know, just fired up. Um, Ill-advised shots, not the best uh, of him. We didn't see his A game. We didn't see him making good decisions. Meanwhile, here's LaMarcus saying, whatever you need, come to me. And the Blazers did, and he paid off big time. Seemed too, Dave. So many times this season we've seen, uh, you know, LaMarcus, if he, he gets off to a little bit of a shaky start, he misses a couple shots from the field, and you see his his shooting percentage on uh, you know for the the whole length of the game really diminished if he doesn't have a, you know able to see the ball go through the basket i mean we see that a lot with shooters in the first place but mm -hmm. it seemed like this was one of the 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 first times in the second half of the season where that shot wasn't going down but the way LaMarcus crashed the offensive glass and, and got, you know, second chance points and the way that he was affecting the game on the defensive end. And it really seemed like, you know, his back to the basket game, normally it's kind of the other way around where if he's shooting the ball well, he really gets it going on offense. But in this case, it was him, you know, playing that back to the basket game. And all of a sudden, you know, he's making three pointers in this in the second half. So it really seemed like you know, it was a different type of game for LaMarcus, but, I mean, it, it certainly had to have been an eye-opening experience for him to see, you know, when I can, can start to dominate in the paint, all of a sudden I become essentially an unstoppable force on offense. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, he got to the cup more than we've seen since the All-Star break. And those easy shots, I think, set up all the rest. And those easy shots caused the Houston defenders to start to worry about shading him inside, which then opened up his outside game and eventually his extreme outside game. When he hit, when he hit that three-pointer late, it was like, this is not fair. What is going on is literally not fair. You could see the, the, the whole Houston Rockets, the arena, everybody going, what the heck is going on here? Because that is not right. A bailout three? I mean, 
the guy's 75% shooting three-pointers, admittedly. Now, Blazer fans, this is where you can use the argument of small sample size correctly. Yes, uh, it's only three out of four, but it must seem to the Rockets like he is just some kind of demon from the north come down to plague them personally because what he did in that game was just not, uh, it would, not only was it not in alignment with his usual performance, as great as that is, but it just was not fair. Dave, uh, you know, talking about LaMarcus uh, and his rebounding ability um, and, and pouring in, what was that, the 18 rebounds in that game for the Trailblazers, I know it was something that you tweeted about basically throughout the entirety of that game, the fact that, you know, the Trailblazers had a lot of inconsistencies and in rebounding and maybe the most important rebound, well, the most important rebound of the night uh, when Damian Lillard goes up to um, tie the ball game, misses the shot, but LaMarcus able to tip the basketball in. You had harped on that all night long, and you could really tell how important rebounding was really on that single play and the effort that the Trailblazers gave on that one play. One of your thoughts, you know, if you could expand a little bit on, on the role of rebounding, especially against a team that, that has, you know, one of the elite rebounders in, in league history. Sure. Uh, the Rockets are going to argue, of course, that that rebound that Dwight Howard got, for, which he was whistled for his sixth foul for, I mean, that uh, they're going to argue that, that Aldridge's was the second most important rebound, but we'll let that go. Basically, what you got to understand is this game was not a, an average game, okay? A lot of really odd, weird things happened with the referees, with the shot selection, everything. You have to pull out maybe several seven, eight-minute stretches of this game if you want to see normal and almost disregard the rest as something wacky and incredible is going on here, okay? If you pull out those stretches, what you will notice is the Blazers, when they made their run, uh, especially in the first quarter, they were doing two things. One is they were offensive rebounding all over the place, and two, they were taking advantage of Houston turnovers. And we, we pegged these as difference makers for the Blazers, potential ways to open that door a crack, even though Houston has some dominating players. And it worked very well in the first period. I mean, in some ways, this was the source of their lead. Much of that evaporated after the first period. And what you saw after that was, on average, Factoring out other things like odd referee calls, the hack of Dwight strategy, James Harden's wacky shot selection, stuff like that, okay? On average, the Rockets did better than the Blazers following the first period, and the rebounding was one of the key reasons for that. When the Blazers are not getting those offensive rebounds and extra points, uh, when they're one and done, when Houston doesn't have to worry about their own board work and they can run out, uh, then it's just two different teams. And on average, the Blazers suffered because they weren't able to rebound, not just the scoring either. They gave Houston extra possessions. A lot of those fouls and a lot of those points that Blazer fans complain about came on the second possession uh, of a set for Houston uh, because the Blazers couldn't secure the rebound and left themselves vulnerable and left themselves in traffic because, by the way, when Houston rebounds, they there are six, seven people around that ball, maybe, and now the shot's going up in traffic, and now there's going to be a whistle. So uh, if the Blazers can control the boards better, the game will not be as close on average as, as we saw. For the Trailblazers, Dave, uh, out-rebounded 59-54, to 54, and you talked about it, giving up 22 offensive rebounds. However... You know, on, on the positive side, Dave, and I think it's worth mentioning, the Trailblazers did have 17 offensive rebounds, even though they gave up those 22. But to get right. the 17 offensive rebounds, and as, you know, as we talked about with LaMarcus, second chance points, especially for him, uh, mm -hmm. was, you know, might have been the difference in the game. It was huge, but you got to, again, draw that dividing line between the first quarter and the rest of the game. I think, uh, as I recall, and I have not looked this up, the Blazers had something like seven offensive rebounds after the first quarter, which would leave them ten for the final three quarters in the overtime period. Okay, So they got almost as many in the first quarter as they did the whole rest of the game. Houston did not have many, I do not believe, in the first quarter. So those 20 or whatever you just said they got, 
all all got packed in, or most of them got packed into the final three quarters, which turned the game on average. And had the game not gone wacky, had the, the hack and white not worked, I mean, let's face it, the Blazers were were staring at a double-digit deficit in the middle of the fourth quarter, from which the hack and white strategy rescued them. The reason they were in that double-digit, you know, penalty was uh, in part because of this rebounding phenomenon and the extra possessions that they were giving Houston, which kind of spoiled otherwise good defense and also their own ability to generate their much-needed extra on offense from their offensive rebounds. Two quick stats, Dave, before we move to the next, you know, next piece that we want to cover. LaMarcus, seven of those 17 offensive rebounds, mm -hmm. and also Robin Lopez, only three offensive rebounds for, you know, what, the, the third best offensive rebounder in the NBA this season, mm -hmm. um, compared to Dwight Howard getting six offensive boards. Um, so that's going to certainly be something to pay attention to, Dave, is, you know, how can Robin Lopez contribute to the offensive boards, um, and can LaMarcus keep up the same pace uh, you know, is he going to keep up that pace? Probably not. But can he continue to crash the glass like he did in Game One? You know, that's certainly going to be a, a big key. There was something that you touched on that I think is worth talking about briefly, uh, or at least however long you want to talk about it. If there are, <laughs> if there are any uh, any any Houston people that somehow uh, are are on our website, I, I think that they probably want you to talk about it more. But the NBA coming out and, and saying that Dwight Howard should not have been assessed his sixth personal foul when he fouled Joel Freeland in overtime. One of your thoughts, Dave, on um, I'm just going to just say the whole situation and leave it as open-ended as possible because I don't know how much disagreement people will have with the fact that that probably should not have been a foul on Dwight Howard. Uh, however, just the whole ecosystem of this game created an environment where it wasn't that surprising that it ended up happening. Yeah, of course that was not a foul on Dwight Howard, and that was unjust. Patrick Beverly's sixth foul was probably not a foul either. Wesley Matthews probably fouled uh, James Harden at the end of regulation before Harden got off his shot. On the other hand, Robin Lopez's foul was sixth foul was probably not merited either. Nor obviously was the technical, which was rescinded uh, there. Patrick Beverly's technical was not merited. I mean, there were calls all over the place that were just weird. And this is part of what you have to live with. I, I think the refereeing. A couple things came to mind. First of all. I'm fairly convinced that in that first half when the Blazers got 17 foul shots and the Rockets got zero, basically that was a mini message from the refs and from the league. We are not going to be taken advantage of, and this is not your grandpa's NBA. Uh, we are not going to be favoring large market teams and the Rockets. Here's your message. You are going to have to earn this. In the second half, the Rockets did indeed begin to earn it. They began going more inside. They got more fouls, obviously, again, dominating the glass, getting the ball in traffic. Uh, that was part of all that, okay? So I don't think that the flow of the game after the first half was all that abnormal. If you take away the hack of Dwight fouls, uh, you have a 32 to 22 advantage for Houston as I recall which you know is probably right around the area that the Blazers are, are gonna have to live with now if you wanna complain about it flow wise 17 free throws in the first half and 62 in the second half and overtime that's a big disparity so obviously the game you know the tenor was different of the officiating you have you know more than three times the amount of fouls called after halftime that you did before I don't mean fouls I mean free throws but you know what I mean in any case you gotta let that go both teams have to understand that neither one took control of the game neither one enforced their will for long and when they did enforce their will by the way the whistles followed so, you have to understand, you do not control the referees, you have to control the opponent. If you do not control the opponent, you leave yourself open to whistles just and unjust. And that's exactly what happened. So, you've got you to chalk all that up, say it happened, and by the way, if you're a Blazers fan, last point, the chaos of this game was good for you. 
because when this game was not chaotic and weird, your team got behind. So all the added extracurricular activity ended up helping you. So don't look too far, Scamps. Sure, there were bad calls, uh, but they happened on both sides. And count your lucky stars. I mean, take the win. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Go on, improve from game two, and build on your strengths. Try to dominate and control the Rockets instead of worrying about controlling the referees. I think one thing that Blazer fans have to be happy with, uh, especially Dave, is... LaMarcus Aldridge getting 13 free throws, going 10 of 13 from the stripe. And, you know, when, when he had that back-to-the-basket game going, there's, he's, like, like we said, he's, there's no one that can guard him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that aggressiveness we learned in game one, you know, you talk about the league sending a message. Mm-hmm. The league is going to favor the more aggressive team. And we knew that coming in, but I think that it became even more obvious uh, last night or uh, in, in game one mm-hmm. because once James Harden started to become more aggressive in, in that second half, even though you know he didn't hit very many shots, he was driving at the basket rather than falling away from the basket. Mm-hmm. Um, and we saw LaMarcus, he was getting his foul calls when he was moving you know, at the basket. Damian Lillard attacking the basket. Uh, and I think that you know this is something that the league, we like I said, we know this. But I think that it was, you know, it really, it was reiterated last night that, you know, the the officials are going to favor the team that's that's taking it to the other team, and you know, we saw that in the first half for the Trailblazers, they were the aggressor. Absolutely, and this is what makes Houston shot selection as the game closed so curious because they fell back into the jumpers, especially Harden, and he could have had his free throws. He could have had the lane, and he did not take it, and they need to look back on that and say, you know, this wasn't just the referees. This was our decision-making that took the game out of our hands and put it into the hands of the Blazers because we asked the refs to bail us out instead of forcing them to make the call. Last topic I want to talk about, Dave, before we get to your keys for Game 2 that's coming up in just a couple of days. A guy that really seemed pretty much absent uh, for the for a lot of the game, especially in that first half when he was trying to guard Chandler Parsons, and that was Nick Batum. A guy that I really felt, you know, we've we've watched him enough to know that there are times that he can totally disappear, and you sort of forget that he's out on the floor. But it really seemed last night was, you know, he sort of picked the wrong game to disappear in that first half. Just struggled defensively. Um, couldn't really get anything going. He did come up late with a couple of really big shots for the Trailblazers. They, you know, they would have really struggled without that offense at the end of the game. But, you know, th- they really need his energy from the get-go if they want to continue to have success, you know, throughout the rest of the series. Of course, and you know that I'm not a Nikola Batum apologist. He is uh, prone to go up and down. We've chronicled this, and it's part of what's frustrating about him. However. Uh, in the first half, he wasn't solely responsible for Parsons. He did have a couple of bad defensive stands against Chandler, uh, admittedly. But you got to remember what you're asking Batum to do. He basically has to be watching three or four people at once, and that changes depending on the set and the play. So he's your help. He's your fireman going to, to put out the fire. Well, when the fireman's going to put out the fire, you don't expect him to cook dinner at home, too. And that's kind of what uh, people were looking at his defense on Parsons and saying, what's going on here? Well, that wasn't the whole story. He did come up better defensively in the second half. He did come up uh, on the boards a little bit. And uh, he also, uh, as you say, had some offensive moves. And I think that latter is what he can improve on the most. This is not going to be an easy series for him, period. Houston has too many uh, weapons, and they need too much. The Blazers need too much help in order to watch him to make Batum's defensive job easy. However, you can't assume that Aldridge is going to score 46 points. You can't assume that Lillard is going to have the same kind of breakthrough every night. Okay, They're going to come back to earth probably. Uh, Batum is the next option, and he has to step up and be more aggressive on the offense because the Blazers last night had nothing but their two stars for most of the game, and that probably 
will not serve, especially if Chandler Parsons, he'll also come back to Earth, but you know, you know he's going to do something, so Batum has to step up and match that at least. You can almost look in the box score, Dave, especially when you think, you know, the aggressor is being rewarded at the free throw line. You can almost look at the number of foul shots that a guy took and, you know, it might not be directly proportional, but at least, you know, there is likely a correlation between aggressiveness and how many free throws you took in the game. You know, LaMarcus, 13. Uh, Lillard had 12. Uh, James Harden had 10. Nick Batum did not take a free throw in game one. And I don't think that there's any question that was because, you know, he, he, he wasn't aggressive in that game. Was he necessarily put in a lot of opportunities to be aggressive? I don't know. But I do think that that's, you know, it's it's something that you can look at on paper and, and really kind of see that if they're going to reward aggressiveness with free throws, uh, you, you have to be aggressive to get to the line, and he was not in game one. Um, and I want to... Okay. Here's, the, here's the deal, though. The other part of that you got to remember is that Houston knows they have a problem with Portland Stars. Where's the next option for help defense? My guess is it's going to be Parsons. Uh, Harden is not going to be all that mm. much help. Beverly is already on. Howard is already on. Uh, Terrence Jones can't leave. So guess who? Uh, if Batum does not make Parsons pay for helping out on the Stars, then the Blazers are probably going to have problems. Let's look ahead to Game 2, Dave. The big wrinkle was in Game 1 was immediately dumping the ball into Wes Matthews and having him play a little bit of back-to-the-basketball against James Harden. Um, you know, that was, it seemed like that was the one thing that, that Portland really wanted to, to pound home um, and really make Harden work in, in game one. Uh, and that was kind of the wrinkle that they gave. And as we know in the playoffs, every single game, you sort of, you don't need a, a, a completely different game plan, but you do need something that's going to make the opponent react to it, that's something that they may not be expecting. And that right now is something that certainly Kevin McHale and his staff are expecting. So is there anything specifically that, that you are, are keeping an eye towards in Game 2, or do you think the, the success at the end of the day still just comes down to how well do LaMarcus and, and Damian play on offense, and can Lopez... Uh, Aldridge and Freeland, you know, that kind of, and, and Robinson as well, kind of that, that tandem in the front court, how well they can contain the bigs of, of Houston? Well, there are a couple things. Number one is the Rockets have got to be kicking themselves, as I said, for their shot selection. It just, they, I, I put it on Twitter several times, and I guess I'll, I'll have the guts to say it here. I don't usually go this far in my analysis because it's not always fair, but this is fair. They were stupid. They made a lot of critical mental mistakes by settling for jumpers when the lane was wide open to them. Jeremy Lin, James Hart, they were going right down the lane, and they were scoring or picking up fouls every time, and they just did not stick with it. There was no reason for them to take a contested jumper in that game ever and they bailed out the Blazers big time. So as the Blazers, you have to know they are coming. You have to hear the drums in the deep and understand that they are going to have a target down the middle of that lane, and you have to be able to rotate or keep your man in front of you if you are the primary defender, and you have to be able to at least slow them down there. The other thing they are going to look at is that Dwight Howard, had a field day whenever he was single covered. Howard's mistakes, for the most part, came when he posted up foolishly also, one on two, one on three, I think once he even went one on four and never passed the ball. Okay, So the Rockets are going to have to adjust by maybe reposting to him, entering it twice to clear out the help defense, or by creating enough distraction elsewhere that they leave Howard single covered, and then they catch him on the move, or, or they move him a little quicker, don't slow post him, to where he's going to score against single coverage, and the Blazers really have to worry about that. I am not sure that there's too much that they can do about that one. But basically, the Blazers have to understand where the Rockets are going to try to come at them and devise a scheme to make themselves a little less vulnerable while at the same time pressing their energy and advantage that they built on, on the other end. You still have to keep an eye on Nick Batum. I mean, to me, that's the big key of game two. It's a guy that, 
you know, struggled in game one, uh, but we know when he plays well, he's such a difficult guy to guard because he can handle the ball, especially at his size. He can shoot, he can drive, he can play a little bit of defense. That's the guy that I'm keeping an eye on for game two. Dave? Two more, two more really quick. Mo Williams, horrible hmm. game, needs better decision-making, better shot. Thomas Robinson, good rebounding. You've got to be aggressive and put that put those back. I think he got overwhelmed a little bit by the playoffs and the atmosphere. He got his rebounds, but then he froze. When you get that rebound, he has to go right back up and try to dunk it, and then he will be more of a weapon. So watch those guys as well. So we will be back with you in a couple of days. The Trailblazers, as we said, and as uh, you've surely been following, win game one in overtime in Houston, game two will also be in Houston, that game at 6.30 on, or excuse me, uh, that's that's actually going to be at 7.30 on the West Coast and uh, on Wednesday. So continue to follow us here on BlazersEdge.com for coverage of everything from Patrick Beverly to Dwight Howard to the officiating uh, uh, in the NBA sending out information about that. Obviously a lot of storylines now that we are in the postseason, so uh, keep it here at BlazersEdge.com. And that's going to do it for us here today. For Dave Deckard, I am Sam Tung. Once again, thank you all so much for joining us here today. We will be back breaking down the next game for the Trailblazers here in a couple of days. So join us all then here on BlazersEdge.com. <laughs>